Hello, church family. We want to thank you for joining us at this time as we gather together here on this Good Friday. A day where we remember our Savior's final steps to the cross. A day that brought much pain, but a day of victory as well. Because we know what was lying ahead for our Savior Jesus Christ. And so as we gather together and remember today, I want to begin with a word of prayer and ask for God to speak to our hearts, to help us remember the sacrifice that was made so that we could be with him. Will you pray? Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this chance to remember your son, the agony that he endured, the shame, the ridicule, all so that we could be made clean. Father, sin, it destroys our lives. It separated us from you. And yet your son, your beautiful son, our wonderful Savior, took all of that upon himself, died on the cross, so that we can be made right with you. So Father, this day we do remember. And we thank you. We thank you for caring for us, for loving us enough to give of your own Son. We are forever grateful. Father, speak to our hearts today. Move within us. And help us to remember the price that has been paid. In Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Pastor. Our worship is centered and focused on Christ. And here at the Easter season, Good Friday, our focus, especially today, is on the cross. So we're going to sing together a couple songs about the cross, and then I'm going to sing a song that uh, we've heard perhaps in our services. But uh, the, two, the two hymns you're going to recognize, you might want to pull out a hymn if you have one at home and sing along with us, Near the Cross. And then at the cross. Yeah. 
One of those songs or the hymns that is familiar to, to most of you watching this, I'm sure, is that song written by Isaac Watts and others at the cross. So let's just sing this song together. Alas, Would you like to live under such a king? 
Luke's gospel reveals such a ruler. In the hours leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, which we reflect upon this day, we actually see disparities between three different rulers. I'm going to read Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to that passage at this time. Beginning in verse 1 of Luke chapter 23. It says, Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And he, when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. In this account, other than Jesus, there are two other rulers or authority figures that are mentioned. The first is Pontius Pilate, a Roman prefect whose job was to rule over the region of Judea for the Roman Empire. And as long as Pilate collected taxes for Rome, and as long as he kept uprisings from taking place in the land, those back in Rome cared very little what he did to the Israelite people. And by all historical accounts, Pilate was a ruthless ruler. He was known in his day for executing criminals without trial, stealing money from the Jewish temple and antagonizing the Jews by erecting statues of the Roman Empire throughout Jerusalem. The other ruler that we see in these verses is Herod Antipas, the Jewish king in Galilee, the area north of Jerusalem itself. And he was essentially a puppet ruler. He was only allowed to exercise authority over the Jewish people in that land because Rome allowed him to do so. And like Pilate, Herod was not a good man. At one point, he married his brother's wife. And then he had the prophet John the Baptist thrown into jail for objecting to that marriage. At his birthday party sometime later, he, he ogled his niece, who also happened to be his stepdaughter at that point. And then at the bequest of her mother or his wife, he had John the Baptist beheaded. Herod was not a good man. And so here in this passage, in the last hours leading up to the cross, we have Jesus standing trial between these two ruthless rulers. Men who had a long track record of killing those who even remotely posed a threat to them. In this passage, the Jewish religious leaders of the day 
They brought Jesus in before Pilate because even though they had already condemned him to death, they weren't allowed to execute him without approval from Rome. So they brought in Jesus before Pilate, trying to convince him to carry out the execution. And in verse 2, these leaders lodged three charges against Jesus. First, they claimed that Jesus had been misleading the people. They were trying to paint Jesus as this rebellious figure who posed a danger to Rome. Someone who might instigate a rebellion within the land. The second thing they claim is that Jesus had been forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar. Now this, of course, was a ridiculous charge because Jesus actually taught the opposite just three chapters earlier in Luke. But the third charge. The third charge is the one that really gets Pilate's attention. It's a charge that is actually true. The Sanhedrin tells Pilate that Jesus claims to be Christ. Now, in case Pilate doesn't understand what that term Christ means, these Jewish religious leaders who are there, they actually uh, translate it into political language, which Pilate would understand. They tell him it means he claims to be a king. This grabs Pilate's attention. Pilate looks at this man who has been brought before him, and he sees this bound, blindfolded, beaten soul before him. At this point, Jesus was sleep deprived and he was covered in spit. Jesus didn't look like a king in the moment. And so Pilate, amused and surprised, he turns to Jesus. And we lose this in our English translation, but Pilate, he, he looks at Jesus and he mocks him in his question. He essentially asks, you're the king of the Jews? You? And Jesus basically deflects in his response. There was really no way for Jesus to accurately answer that question in the moment. Yes, he had taught that he would one day rule at the right hand of God. But no, he wasn't a king, at least in the way that Pilate intended the question. Jesus, our king, he didn't look the part on that day as he was journeying to the cross, but then again, he never really looked the part while he was here on this earth. Because kings aren't born in a cave of animals. Kings are not carpenters. They sleep in royal palaces. They do not roam around the land with no place to rest their heads. Kings have powerful followers who support them. Not a ragtag bunch of fishermen, tax collectors, and other rejects. Kings don't stand quietly and passively, beaten bloody and bowed in front of their people's enemy as well. On that fateful day 2,000 years ago, Jesus didn't look like a king to the people gathered around him. Pilate looked at Jesus. He didn't see a king. He didn't see a threat to his political power. And so he turned to the chief priests and the crowd that had gathered and he says, I find no guilt in this man. But the people, they've come too far to give up at this point. And so they lodge one more complaint. They tell Pilate that Jesus has been stirring up trouble throughout Judea from Galilee all the way to Jerusalem. And upon hearing that, Pilate suddenly saw a way to pass this problem off to someone else. You see, Roman law stated that a man could be tried for a crime, either in the place where the alleged crime took place, or in his home province. 
And so upon learning that Jesus was a Galilean, Pilate decided to send Jesus off to Herod. Let him deal with this. Now, while Pilate was just trying to pass all this off on Herod, Herod essentially being this puppet of Rome, well, he likely took Pilate's actions here as a courtesy. Eventually, as we see in verse 12, these two men became friends as they collaborated together over this matter of what to do with Jesus. And when Herod sees Jesus, he is excited. He is delighted. He's heard stories about Jesus. He has been looking forward to an opportunity to meet him for some time. In fact, as we see here, Herod was hoping that Jesus would perform some miracle for him. Herod wanted to see Jesus do some tricks. But Jesus refused. And so Herod and his men, they decided to have some fun at his expense. They ridicule him. They mock him. And then they array him in splendid clothing, the type of clothing a king would wear. This was their way of saying, you want to be king? All right, we'll make you king. They were mocking the very idea that Jesus could be a king. So here in this account, we have two rulers who have Jesus right before them, and neither of them see it. Neither of them see Jesus as a king. But what do you see when you look at Jesus? He may not have ever looked apart, but appearances can be deceiving. Jesus was and is God's chosen Messiah, the anointed one who will reign forever over a kingdom that will have no end. Jesus isn't a ruler like any other, but make no mistake, he is a king. And that's great news for us. On that day, as Jesus stood before his accusers, before these earthly rulers, Jesus was about to establish his kingdom on a cross. Our beautiful king. He endured public ridicule and shaming for our sins. Jesus became a guilty man on that day. In taking our sins upon himself, Jesus made himself guilty before God. But vindication was coming. On this day in history, it looked as if Jesus was defeated. But we know the truth. Jesus is always victorious, even if it seems like he's losing. Standing before Pilate and Herod, Jesus was about as low as you can get. Bloody, beaten, abandoned, mocked, derided. But despite all of that, in this passage, in this account, there is still only one king. Jesus is still the king. There may be times in our lives and in our world when things don't appear to be going well. The circumstances around us may make it seem that God and his plans have been defeated. But in all circumstances, at all times, Jesus is still the king. If Jesus was control, if he was still the king before Pilate and Herod, then he is certainly still in control and he is still the king right now. He is still ruling over everything that is happening in our lives and in our world. Things may not always look well, but Christ is still ruling over his creation. I stated at the beginning that a lot of people are drawn to stories about kings, kingdoms, princes and princesses. And that's because there is something deep down in each of us that longs for a king. 
There's something within us that longs for a noble, wise, sacrificial ruler who will deliver us from our enemies. Our hearts yearn to live under the authority of someone who cares, guides, and protects us in all circumstances. And even when we see Jesus broken, bloody, bowed, and hanging from a cross, we still see our beautiful Savior. Jesus Christ, the King our hearts have always longed for. Jesus is our King. But most importantly, we are His. Will you pray with me? Father God, we come before you at this time recognizing that if we were to look at the circumstances that were taking place on that day 2,000 years ago, it would be a challenge to see any good coming from all of that. To see Jesus beaten, made fun of, stripped, and put on a cross. Father, it was the darkest of days. And Father, throughout history, there have been dark periods as well. Times when we have looked out into our own world and have wondered, God, what are you doing? How can this be good? What will come from this? But what we learn from this account, Father, is that you are still working. You are still in control. You are still ruling over your creation. And Father, today we come and bow our hearts before you, our God, and before your Son, Jesus Christ, as our King. Thank you for being that good, benevolent, kind ruler that our hearts long for. Thank you for caring enough for us to reach out to us, to extend that hand to bring us back to yourself in fellowship. Father, we are grateful for you, and we are grateful for your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. I want to encourage you, church family, on this weekend where we celebrate our risen Savior, I encourage you to remember that this weekend is about Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter that we aren't together physically close to one another. Easter doesn't need to be postponed. It doesn't need to be canceled. We can celebrate, wherever we might be, the fact that our King still reigns. So I encourage you to do that this weekend. I want to close by reading the lyrics of a great hymn. I'm not going to sing it. I'm not that great of a singer, but I'll read it, and I know you'll know the words. It says, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Praise be to our matchless king. God bless.